Can everybody see this okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, um, last year I was here too. Um, I gave a really simple introduction to translation, and then I talked a little bit about the translation of poetry. What I'm hoping to do, to do today is to focus on the translation of classical Chinese and to approach this issue from a literary perspective, um, which I think intersects somewhat with what you are doing right now. Okay, so first a brief summary of um, what I'm going to be doing in this talk. I'm going to begin with a really short introduction to classical Chinese. I'll talk a little bit about the nature of the language and how it's going to be your translation. And then I'll go on into some of the tools that you might be able to use when you're trying to understand the source text. 
and understanding a source text and a classical language is going to be somewhat different from understanding a source text, let's say, in a modern language. Um, I will then go on to approach the issue from a theoretical perspective and discuss what kind of evidence to use and not to use when you're considering certain interpretations. And if we have time towards the end, I'm hoping we can have some um, interesting discussions. Uh, this time, um, I prepared fewer slides than I had last time, so hopefully we'll have some more time in the end um, to talk about what you're interested in. Okay, first a little bit about classical Chinese or classical languages in general. Um, when you're translating from a classical language as the source language, the experience is going to be somewhat different from when you're translating from a modern language. And I think the key here is that um, you're translating from a language that nobody has made a command of. When you're translating from a modern language, chances are it wouldn't be difficult to find native speakers of that language. Very often you yourself are a native speaker of the language you're translating into. Uh, this is, if you're familiar with interpreting, this is what they refer to as B2A, interpreting, translating into your best language, and this is pretty common. Now, uh, this is important because when you do this, you have a feel for the language. It's not only the means of words or sentences, but rather the nuances and the register and everything else that comes with the meaning of the text. Um, that is something that you're able to get as a native speaker, harder to get when you are not. Now, there are also instances when you're translating out of a certain modern language that you're not a native speaker of, and if there's anything you don't understand, um, if it's Chinese or English, there are lots of native speakers around you. So it wouldn't be too hard to ask around and get a sense of what the text that you're looking at means. That is, if you're translating from a modern language. Now, not so with a classical text. The classical texts that we're looking at are mostly dead languages. They are languages that nobody speaks natively. By that, what I mean is nobody is born into an environment where they naturally acquire the language prior to the critical period. When you think about how you acquire English or Chinese, if it's your native language, usually you don't learn it in the classroom, but you learn it by being in that environment and by making mistakes and eventually mastering all aspects of the meaning um, of words and sentences of the language that you're dealing with. You can't really do that with a classical language because there are no native speakers to speak with you using that language. You may be an avid reader, you may have read a lot of texts in the language, but you're not getting any feedback. So when you, you use the language, um, there's no way to correct you to tell you if a certain usage is uh, right or wrong. Okay, so we're dealing with a text or a language where there are no native speakers, and problems arise when you come across passages with obscure meaning, passages that you're not sure um, what it means. Does anybody have that experience? Anybody come across that? <laughs> okay. And later on, I'm going to ask you what you do in these instances. But a lot of what you do, I believe, is you have to depend on speculation, guesswork. And when you do this sort of guesswork, it's kind of like um, learning a foreign language. It's kind of like uh, trying to read a language that's related to your native language, but not quite the same. And what we want to know is, um, how accurate this guesswork is, and what methods are there to make your guessing a little bit more focused or more accurate. So this I'm going to take as the starting point of my talk. Um, what do you do if you're translating out of a classical language that you are not a native speaker of, and you run into problems? Okay, now, um, okay, before I go further, let me ask you, what would you do? What do you do when you translate out of classical Chinese and there's an expression that you don't understand? What do you turn to? Dictionary. Okay, Dictionary. Okay, good. Commentary. Good. Dictionaries, commentaries. What kind of dictionaries? Online. <laughs> Google. Google. Okay, good. Uh, do they work? Do you find what you're looking for in the dictionaries that you're looking at? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, how is using Google different than using a dictionary? Modern. It's usually doing a modern translation. Oh, okay. 
So when you say Google, you're talking about a Google search or using Google translation, which is where do you use both of these? Search engine translation. Search engine. Okay. Good. Good. Any other needs? Any other methods that people have in common? Compared to other translations or other languages. Okay. Compared to other translations, uh, sources in other languages. Okay. All of these. I was say one of the things looking forward or back in the same text and okay. seeing what seems to logically connect exactly. and what you do understand. Okay, that is a very important thing. Looking in the same text, looking at the structure of the text and seeing, seeing what uh, clues you get from there. Maybe okay. you can also look yeah. at the, uh, the same phrase or words in different, uh, different, uh, different works to see in different contexts if they, they might bring out different meanings. Okay, so you might do something like a corpus search, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you take this expression and see what other classical texts exactly. that this expression has appeared in, and using the context that it appears in to help determine uh, what the meaning of that expression might be. Okay, that is very good. So a lot of what I was planning to talk about, mm -hmm. I think you have covered already, but there may be some people here who are not as familiar with this method, these methods. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in the first half of my lecture. Okay, so you've covered a lot of the, uh, um, in your answers you've covered a lot of the methods already. You might be able to just fall back on your knowledge of the modern Chinese, knowledge of the modern language, which is uh, related but not exactly the same. Um, a lot of people do this. You might try to look the expression up in a dictionary. You might look for a commentary or you might look for scholarly articles on the subject and see what kind of analyses that they are performing. Okay, let's let's talk about each of these. Um, let's begin with an example, a really simple example. Or actually, before I do that, let me do something else. Okay, um, when translating out of classical Chinese, a lot of people instinctively fall back on their ability, ability in modern Chinese. And sometimes this is okay, sometimes this is tricky. The reason for that is because modern Chinese is related to classical Chinese, but sometimes things are not exactly the same. When we rely on modern Chinese, a lot of times what we're relying on is related words, comments. Okay, um, so in this sense, when you're a modern Chinese speaker looking at classical Chinese, it's like if you were an English speaker uh, looking at German or a Spanish speaker looking at Portuguese. You're looking at a language that's related, but not exactly the same. You might rely on comments, words of common origin. You might rely on your abilities of free association, but you have to be careful because this ability to freely associate might be sensitive to your time and place. When you think of a word and other things that are related to it, it's related to your life experience. And because you live at this time in this place, uh, this, your experiences might be different from that of the person who wrote the text. And of course, um, a lot of the time, you're going to have to rely also on your creative imagination, which might or might not be accurate. Okay, so let's look at where we can go with that. But before we go there, uh, let me do a little experiment. Um, I mentioned that this, this process is kind of like an English speaker trying to read German. If you already know German, don't try to read this. If you don't know German, Let's do this experiment. Here I have a German passage. Okay, um, you guys read it and then tell me what it means if you don't know German. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Erste Sommer, Ende Juni, die Sonne scheint warm an Deck des Lego Hutes, der Wind ist Güter. Okay, so who would like to take a guess? It is summer, okay? And then? And the two. Okay. Uh, the sun is warm. The sun is warm. Okay. And the wind is blowing. Okay. Now, let me ask one of you who answered how you arrived at this answer. Okay. Any volunteers? The first sentence. Uh, who said it is summer? Okay, how do you know it is summer? I recognize summer. Okay, it looks similar to summer, right? <laughs> it's a difference of one letter, 
And this is what we're referring to when we talk about comments. Words that are related, but not exactly the same. Did you use context? Did you rely on context when you guessed that this is summer? Uh, yeah. Okay, what context? Um, summer is capitalized in, I think, the follow, in the following sentence. Was that June? Okay. Um, so the June gives you a clue to summer, right? Because uh, June is summer. And also, June is a cognate. The end up here uh, is a cognate to English end, too. And because they all fall within this general schema of summer, once you have a few words belonging to the schema, it's, it's easier to get, guess the rest. Okay, uh, Isona shined bomb on deck des Segelhutis. Okay, a lot of you said the sun shined warm, right? Uh, anybody want to tell me how you arrived at that? Well, Zona is kind of like sun, right? And then the warm is a clue. Okay, something that shines warm, what shines warm, that directs you to the sun. Okay, and this is also something that happens within the general schema of summer. Okay, so this is a too hard to guess. Did anybody get deck des Zegelbutis? Yeah? Very good. How did you get that? Yeah, that is the same, and then that is the above, and mm -hmm. then that thing looks like a boat, and I guess that's <laughs> It is a deck of a sailboat, and that actually is one of the hardest words to guess in this, uh, uh, in this passage. Okay, and then der Wind is Kuhl. He is easy to get, right? Der Wind is the wind, and what about Kuhl? Cool. Okay, so there, there you go, yeah. So why is that capitalized and sailboat? In German, all nouns are capitalized. Okay, so you notice that everything that's capitalized here is a noun, unless it's at the uh, beginning of the sentence. Okay, so is this kind of like what you do when you um, decipher classical Chinese? Do you have to guess? Do you rely on context? <laughs> okay. Um, but where do things start to go wrong is, I'll give you a second example. And in the second, second example, if you know French, then don't guess. If you don't know French, then do your best to guess what this means. And since I don't know French, I'm not going to try to uh, read this. Just give me a general sense of what the sentence is about. Something's happening. <laughs> Something's happening in the library. Something's happening in the library, okay. Anything else? Any other clues? <laughs> Something about raisins in the library? Maybe, maybe a sass of raisins in the library? Okay. Well, that would be what most people would naturally guess. But if you know French, you'll, you'll know that raisin is not actually raisin. Raisin is grapes. Okay, that's word related because raisins are made from grapes, right? And the library here is not actually library. Library is bookstore. Okay, so you get thrown by these uh, related but not identical um, words. What it says here is I left the bag of grapes in the bookstore. Okay, so it speaks a little bit. Okay, and the same applies to when you're using your modern Chinese to try to understand classical Chinese. Okay, so when you come across uh, expressions, words that you don't understand, for a lot of people, your first instinct would be to look it up in a dictionary. Okay, and there are different kinds of dictionary that, that you can look up. Some of you might try a general modern Chinese dictionary, like the Xinhua Zidi. Some of you might go for something that's aimed more particularly at classical Chinese, like this Wu Hai Yu Chang Yong Zi Zi Yi. Some of you might go for a more comprehensive Chinese language dictionary, like the Zhongwen Da Zi Yi, which has 370,000 entries, or the Hai Yu Da Zi Yi, or Hai Yu Da Zi Yi, which has approximately the same number of entries. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give you a simple example, and we're going to try looking up that expression in each of these dictionaries and see what happens and see what kind of problems we come across. Okay, the first example that I'm going to use, oh, I forgot to mention, of course, in your field, 
you might uh, look at some specialized dictionaries, such as a dictionary of Buddhism. Okay, but uh, um, I won't be talking about Buddhism today. I'm just going to go with more general classical texts, like the Analyze and Confucius. Okay, so in my first example, I'm going to take a line for the Ballad of Mulan, which some of you might be familiar with. If you are familiar with it, uh, pretend you don't know what it means, and we're going to try to decipher it. Okay, so the ballad begins with the expression titi, fu titi. Suppose you have no idea what titi means. Let's try and look it up in the dictionaries that I just showed you. Let's try the Xinhua Zidu. We look it up and it's not in the dictionary. Okay, so that doesn't help. Maybe better luck with the classical Chinese dictionary. We look it up in the Ohai Yu Chang Yong Zidu and it's not in the dictionary. Okay, let's try the comprehensive Chinese dictionary. You try the Zhongwen Da Zidu and the Hai Yu Da Zidu. And the, um, the answers are slightly different. In the Zhongwen Da Zidu, it gives you five answers. Tai Qi Sheng, the sound of Sai. Number two, Chong Shen, the sound of insects. Number three, Niao Sheng, the sound of birds. Number four, Shu Sheng, the sound of mice. And number five, Xi Sui Zhi Sheng, a sharp piercing sound. In the Hai Yu Da Zidu, it also begins with Tai Qi Sheng, a sighing sound, but it gives something different in number two. Zai Tai Sheng, the sound of praising somebody. In number three, it kind of includes two, three, and four for from the Zhongwen Da Zidu. Niao Ming, Chong Ying Sheng, the sound of birds or insects. And then number four, it says Yu Lao Da, just like when you're complaining. Okay. Now, that's better than nothing, right? It's better than looking it up and not finding it in the dictionary. But now you're faced with a different dilemma. Uh, faced with so many different definitions, which one do you go with? And here you have to go back to your creative imagination. You have to go back to your um, experience-based association and try to decide what fits best in here. Uh, given these definitions, what do you think fits best in here? Insects, birds, mice, uh, sign, crazy, complaining? The sound of nature. Uh, the sound of nature, you mean like birds, insects? Okay, and that's a possibility. Uh, if you read the rest of the poem, some of you might go with sighing or, um, or complaining. Okay, but uh, for now, I basically just want to use this example to illustrate that once you find your answer in the dictionary, it's not all that easy finding the uh, correct answer. I think I have another example here. Um, in my second example, I'm taking this line from the analytes, Yu Jiao Wu Lei. Okay, uh, the, all four of these words appear in modern Chinese. Yu and Wu, of course, you already know. Jiao is something that is used in teaching or education. And Lei in modern Chinese usually means category. But uh, the problem here is that when you put the Lei over here, it's hard to make sense of it. Okay, so again, we're going to look it up in a dictionary. In the Xinhua Zidu, you look up Lei, and it says Zhong. Number one is kind. Number two, Lei Si Hao Xiang, similar to. Number three is Da Shui. I think what they mean here is Da Gai, which is approximately. So you have a measure word, uh, you have a verb, and you have an adverb. Now, you try your luck in the Wu Han Yu Chang Yong Zi Zi Jin. And you end up with just one more. So you still have the late kind. You still have lei si xia, be similar to. You still have da ni da zhi, approximately. And you end up with number four, xiao li, which is rules or regulations. And is this enough to help you translate uh, this expression to jiao wu lei? If you didn't know it at all, and you look at the dictionary and it gives you this, do um, you think you can produce a translation that you're happy with? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? Okay. Um, well, let's go one step further then, if not. Oh, before I go there, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are people, however, that base their translations purely on this. Let's look at what these translations look like. 
they, and they basically go with this the dr more delayed interpretation of delay. So in D.C. Lau's translation, in instruction there is no separation into categories. The Brooks and Brooks translation, there is teaching but there are no kinds. Uh, the Hinton translation, in worthy teaching all things are related. Okay, let's look at these one by one. The first one. In instruction, there is no separation into categories. How many of you understand what this means? <laughs> okay, it's worded in a way that's hard to understand, so you really have to guess to make sense of it, even in English. But this may be intentional. It may be that because in Chinese it's hard to understand, this translator wants to mirror the Chinese uh, reader's experience, and so comes up with a similar sentence in English. Now, when you're given a sentence like this in English, you have to use your experience to try to make sense of it. When he says, in instruction, there is no separation into categories. To you, what does no separation into categories mean? No varieties of instruction. No music versus uh, physics. Very good. OK. I think this is probably the easiest interpretation to make. So you don't teach different subjects. You don't have math class, English class, physics class. Everything is taught together. Uh, that seems to be the most obvious reading of this. Um, in this translation, in instruction, there is no separation into categories. What is late translated as? As in one, two, three, or four. One would be late. Two would be late. Three would be action. Four would be jumping. This would be delay. This would be delay. And then um, the delay isn't interpreted as to what kind of delay. In the second example we have here, there is teaching, but there are no kinds. Okay? Can people make sense of this? What does there are no kinds mean? This is probably even harder than the first two to interpret. Um, let's look at the last one. In worthy teaching, all things are related. OK, the first thing I want to ask you here is, which interpretation of lay does David Hinton use? Lay or xia. Let's see. Hmm. But then lay would be not lay whereas he says they are related rather than they are not related. OK, so that is a little bit odd, but he seems to be going direction. Okay, now with these examples what I want to illustrate is that if you limit yourself to these um, interpretations then this is probably what your translation would look like. It might be something you want to do, it might not be something you want to do, perhaps you want to make it easier on the English language reader in which case you would have to interpret the link a little bit deeper and we'll see later how we can do that. Okay, now um, so far we've only looked at the Hainyi Zidian. If we look at a comprehensive dictionary like the Hainyi Tang Zidian, and we look up Lei, then we get about 16 different uh, interpretations. Number one, Zhong Lei. Number two, Zhu Lei. Number three, Ba Shi Ba Zi. Number four, Shi Li. Number five, Xing Mao Xing Xiang. Number six, Xiang Si. Number seven, Bi Jiao Ping Bie. Number eight, Lei Si. Number nine, Shan Mei Hao. Number ten, Zun Xun. Number 11, Zhong Duo. Number 12, which is what we had before, Da Yi. Number 13, the name of a mythical beast, which looks like a fox. Number 4 <laughs> is the name of a ritual. Number, number 15 is uh, when you're divining something, if the swimming turtle turns its head left, then that is known as Lei. And number 16 is it's the same as another character that looks like it. OK, now if you're given with all these choices, and um, you don't have any idea which is more common, which is less common, then this can be very confusing. So um, not finding your answer is not a good thing. Finding too many answers also presents you with potential problems. And in this sort of situation, you really have to go on and depend on other clues to help you determine which of your um, meanings it is. OK. so. The problem with looking things up in the dictionary is that, number one, classical Chinese goes back a long way. Um, it has a history of maybe two to 3,000 years. And the lexicon that's accumulated during this time 
in all the texts that were written during this time is probably not enough uh, or is actually too many to cover in any single dictionary. So you're often going to find expressions that don't appear in any dictionary at all, especially when you're dealing with more obscure texts and not something that is uh, more common, like the analytes. The second is, when you do find your answer, you often have to choose the right option out of many, and very often you learn how to loop. You have to depend on your ability of free association or creative imagination. And number three, when you're trying to find that right definition, uh, what you have to rely on a lot of the time is the context and how you can make logical sense of that word within a given context. These are the challenges of trying to find a definition in a dictionary. All right, so if not a dictionary, then where do we turn to? And a lot of you earlier told me that uh, you can look up commentaries, which would be the next thing we want to look at. Now, commentaries are nice because it takes away the guesswork. Okay, you're not given 15 definitions to choose from. Rather, you can be sure that when a commentator comments on a particular expression, it's this exact same text that you're working with and not something different. Okay, so in this sense, it's good. We do want to find commentaries on the text that you're working with. Now, in some cases, like with dictionary definitions, you have a lot of commentaries and you have to sort through them. Some of them may be more reliable than others. So there are certain dimensions that you have to consider. One is a temporal dimension, uh, which commentaries are closer to the time of the author, which are later. And the later they are, sometimes um, their language gets further removed from the language of the period we're looking at. The other is the scholarly dimension. How reputable is the person making the commentary? Does he have a good track record? Has he commented on a lot of other stuff? And is it received favorably in the scholarly uh, community? Or is he a total wacko who just makes a uh, comment on something and you can't really check on it? OK, examples. If we wanted to look up Yu Jiao Wu Lei, uh, this comes from the Analytes. Some of the commentaries that we can go to are uh, there is this Wu Qiu Bei Zhai Lun Yu Ji Cheng that was published in 1966. It consists of 308 volumes of commentaries on the analytics. Okay, so that's a lot of commentaries to sort through. If you have the time, we can go through every volume and see what different interpretations you can get uh, late. It is a little late to do. I'm using a different late. <laughs> <laughs> because um, if you actually look at this, um, what should I call it, this collection, um, they don't actually give you this line and then have all the commentaries underneath. Rather, you have to go, through, go to each volume and then go to that particular passage and then look for the commentary. So that makes it a little bit tedious. If you don't have the time, then you could go to something like uh, Shang Shu De, 1943, Lei Yu Ti which kind of condenses it to four volumes, which is still a lot. Now, if you go through these commentaries, you will find that most of the commentaries define the link in this manner. Most of them define lay as a verb, meaning to differentiate or to discriminate. Now, you might be wondering, how do we get that? None of the dictionary definitions that we were looking at earlier said discrimination or differentiation. Now, there's a little trick that is performed over here. Um, this relates to a property of classical Chinese, and that is, in classical Chinese, word class conversion is pretty common. So it's pretty easy to take a verb and use it as a noun, or to take a noun and use it as a verb. Actually, in, in American English, that happens quite a lot, too. For example, we take a word such as service, which is a noun, but then I can service my car, right, which is using it as a verb, or to invite which is a verb. And when you receive an invite, uh, that's an S. Okay, in classical Chinese, there's a lot of this, too. Some of you might remember reading something like, uh, let's see. Or no, we don't even have to go to classical. Ha means good, which is adjective. But ha, she likes something. 
uh, will be of the same character. Uh, slight change in tone, change of word class. OK, so to get back to this issue, which is that in the dictionary, the dictionary tells you that uh, lay is a category or a kind of lay. So that means it's either a measure word or a noun. And yet, over here, it's telling you that it's discrimination or differentiation, which comes from changing that noun into an action, into a verb. OK, so this is what we get for most commentaries. Lay means discrimination or differentiation. But here you should be asking a second question, which is discrimination or differentiation along what lines? When Confucius says, yu jiao wu lei, uh, what is he discriminating or not discriminating? And this is where a lot of commentators are using their creative imaginations. OK, some commentators say it's differentiation along socioeconomic status, meaning rich versus poor. Some commentators say it's ethnicity, so it's citizens of the Middle Kingdom, like the Han Chinese, versus the barbarians from the outer regions. OK, this is an ethnic difference. Some say it's an academic ability difference, smart versus dumb. Some say it's moral fortitude, good people versus bad people. And some people say it's subject matter, which we talked about before. Um, in the English translations, a lot of the translators go for the first one, social economic status. So you get translations that say, I'm going to lift this up a little bit. I don't think it's that. Oh, it's not that at all. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to read it to you. The first one you can see. In instruction, there is no such thing as social classes. So here, the lay is clearly interpreted as um, differentiating between social classes, right? Um, the second one I have here comes from Suthill, 1968. And what he says is pretty much the same thing. In matters of instruction, there should be no class distinctions. OK, you can see that these translations are very different from the ones that we saw before, which talk about categorization or kinds or differentiation of subjects. This is taking a totally different interpretation, which is to interpret, uh, interpret differentiation further and interpret it as um, a difference in social class. And um, we'll return to this example a little bit later. Um, what I want to do next is to take you from commentary into scholarly analysis. Commentary is relying on the opinions of others, listening to others and see how they interpret it. Um, as a scholar, what you want to do then is to listen to all these commentators and start to think what makes better sense. And when you try to decide what makes better sense, you might be relying on your logic. You might be relying on your knowledge of classical Chinese grammar. You might be relying on the formal structure of the text. You might want to look at the rhetorical devices or the stylistics. And you might, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, take that expression and throw it into a corpus and do a corpus comparison. OK, let's try and do some of that. Um, first, returning to our first example from Mao and Hulu. OK, Jiji Pu Jiji. What can we do with this? First, let's perform a philological analysis. That is to say, what we pronounce, what we read as ji in modern Mandarin, probably, actually, most likely, was not pronounced ji uh, a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. And there are books that will tell you exactly what it would have been pronounced as. So in Middle Chinese, uh, this ji would have been pronounced as zik. So it would be tick 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 tick. Uh, does tick tick sound like anything to you? We just heard that. <laughs> 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 what was that? <laughs> 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 oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Perfect or something. Okay. So it sounds like the sound of a cricket. Good. Now, um, we can also look at the structure of the text. If you read a little bit further, in lines three and four, you actually get a lot of clues. Um, what they're telling you here is you're not hearing a jifusheng, you're not hearing the sound of the loom. Uh, you only hear the sound of a woman sighing. 
So there is a good chance that the TT is either the woman sighing or it's the sound of the woman. Which one do you think is more likely? Sighing. Sighing? Because it's phrased in the positive way. It's telling you, um, it's not the room, it is this. So that would be the, the first thing to go for, uh, the sound of sign. And that's something that we also found in the dictionary. But if you look at it from a different point of view, you could also argue from a literary perspective that, uh, yes, physically, you don't hear the loom, you only hear the sigh, but, um, let's see, what am I trying to say here? But mentally, on a different level, what you're really hearing is the loom. That could also be a possibility, right? Okay, so, but at least that narrows it down to these two things. It's either a loom or sighing. Now let's throw it into a corpus and see what we get. Okay, so we want to throw the TT into a corpus, see how many instances of uh, the loom sound we get, how many instances of the sign we get, and earlier in the dictionary you also had the insects and that kind of stuff, see how often that appears. Okay, now um, I'm not going to give you the full corpus results, just the more obvious ones. First, the sound of the loom. None. I was not able to find any. Second, uh, the sound of a woman sign. You get plenty of these. Okay, in Baiji's poem, uh, The Song of the Lute, you have Wowen Pi Pa Tai Xi. Okay, here you have the Tai the sign. And then going with that is Yu Wen Si Yu Zhong Ji Ji. Okay, this seems to indicate that this is sign. In Yuan Zheng's poem, you have Nian Nian Xi Wu Tan. Again, poem here with sign. And there's a Shitai Rong poem, Shui Luo, Shui Luo Xia Jiao Ge, Ju Xiao Fu, Wu Chen, Ji Ji Fu, Ji Ji Fu Xin Tan, Le Ming Wu Sha Ru. Okay, the Ji Ji again co occurs with the Tan. So there seems to be pretty strong evidence that Tan Xi is a good candidate. And then let's go for the insect sounds. Okay, um, we do have it co-occurring with insect sounds, but whenever you have the insect sounds, there seems also to be the sign. So here you have Okay, so you have the Shongsha, but you also have the Tanxi. And the one that's not showing here is Okay, again, you have the uh, insects, but you also have the fancy. So everything seems to be, or I should say, every instance of the TT seems to be linked to the Taishi. And the evidence here, I think, is pretty strong. Okay, coming to our second example, uh, uh, we talked about commentaries earlier. Let's see, where were we earlier with the lei? Let me go back. Differentiation. Okay, differentiation, right? Um, and differentiation along what lines? Social, economic. Okay, good. That's where we were. And you might want to ask where that interpretation comes from, or what's the earliest instance? Uh, that earliest and uh, that interpretation into uh, differentiation along lines of social class. And for that, you could trace that interpretation to uh, Wang Kai of the 5th century. His comment is, Okay, among people, you have the richer and the poor, and they all deserve education. You shouldn't choose not to teach them because they are of a lower class. Once you teach them, they become good. So it's not that uh, the rich and the poor were different to begin with. It's a difference in whether or not they have received education. Now, a lot of people take the first half of this. We'll revisit the second half a little bit later. But the first half basically says whether you are rich or poor, you deserve to be educated. Okay, notice that the voice of this commentary by Huang Kai is an exhortation. That is to say, he is telling you what you should do. He's not telling you what he is doing. 
it's not a description of something that's already happening. It's more, uh, it's more telling you something that you should be doing. Okay, is this clear to everybody? Now, a lot of the later commentators that took this, um, those of you that studied this passage in modern textbooks, probably um, read interpretations that are penned by these more modern commentators. They take it to be a description rather than an exhortation. Okay, so for example, in Yang Huajun's version, he says, or now the difference here is that you have Confucius talking about himself rather than Confucius telling you what you should do. Can people see the difference? Okay. Um, does this make sense to you? Do you think Confucius is talking about himself here? Or do you think he is telling you what you should do? Or is it something else? Do, do you have any doubts about this interpretation? Uh, Jiao Wu Lei as Confucius talking about himself. Nothing at all. It's just these four characters on their own. See you. You tell me. Now, now, always look at this with a skeptical mind. I think you're probably thinking, okay, these are famous, uh, reliable commentators, so I'm not going to doubt their interpretation. But I'll bet there's a little voice at the back of your head asking, well, if it's Confucius speaking, why is there no war or Wu? If he's talking about himself, don't you think he should say Wu? You tell Wu Lei. Or Wu? You tell Wu Lei. So the first question you should be asking is Is it possible to give a description of yourself and drop the pronoun? Drop the Wu. Let's fall back on your modern Chinese first. In modern Chinese, can you do that? Um, let's take some of these you know, expressions in modern Chinese. You guys know mm -hmm. If I were to say mm -hmm. does it mean mm -hmm. If I were to say mm -hmm. does it mean mm -hmm. Actually, if you're talking about yourself and without any context, the so needs to be there. Mm -hmm. So the interpretation of you as you uh, I personally think you should cast out none because of the lack of the law. And second, you should look at the analects, at other texts in the analects. When Confucius is talking about himself, does he use one? He seems to do so all the time. Okay. He doesn't just say He says The law is there. He says Okay, whenever he's talking about himself. The pronoun, the I, seems to be there. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing here is to examine the voice, to ask, is it an exhortation? Is it a description? And the grammar of classical Chinese, whether you're able to drop the pronoun in this instance, should help you arrive at uh, um, one of the answers. OK, but uh, that's not all of it. In addition to interpreting it as an exhortation, or as a description. Um, earlier I said the exhortation came from Wang Kan. Wang Kan lived in the 5th century, right? So um, how long is that after Confucius, after the time of Confucius? Thousand years. About a thousand years, right? So you might want to ask, uh, is there anybody that lived closer to the time of Confucius? A thousand years is a long time. A thousand years is older than Shakespeare, older than Beowulf. Okay. Now, if you wanted to go with something that's closer, um, you'll find a clue in Ban Gu's Han Shu. And in Ban Gu's Han Shu, you have this very long passage that ends with Gu Kong Zi Yue Yu Jiao Bu Lei. I'll save you the trouble of reading through all this. What he is basically saying here is that uh, uh, the Han Dynasty basically sent these two officials to these distant corners of the kingdom places that were not considered as civilized. And after these two officials educated the people there, 
uh, these people became educated and were no different from the Han Chinese that were in the more central parts of the kingdom. So the moral myths, once people uh, receive education, there are no differences between um, whether you are civilized or not civilized based on ethnic differences, spiritual differences, or whatever. So this is a very different interpretation from what we had before. It's not telling you what you should do. It's not Confucius describing what he did. But it's saying, basically, if you do this, then you will get this result. This is actually a conditional. Okay. It is saying that if you educate them, then there will be no differences. If there is no instruction, there is no categorization. In the words of Dawson, or basically education removes differences or prejudice. Now, you might also want to ask, check it with modern Chinese. In modern Chinese, when you have two verb phrases, one after another, can it be an if-then condition? Can you think of any instances where A, B means if A, then B in modern Chinese? Now, earlier, we did the test. Uh, in modern Chinese, can you say, I did something without the I? And the answer seems to be no. So we want to check this with modern Chinese, too. Can we say A, B, without any connectors, uh, any conjunctions, and have it mean if A and B? Can we? The examples that I'm able to come up with are, uh, and I'm not going to see them here. In Chinese, you could say, uh, and there's two verb phrases here. The first is 不打. The second is 不成才. The structure of this expression is if you 不打, if you don't get them, then 不成才. They're not going to be promising. You also have things like uh, 好心有好报, which means basically if you are 好心, then uh, you will get a 好报. But of course, the if and the then are all implicit. And it's OK in Chinese to have and then, then implicit. So if we are going with the interpretation that you tell Wu Lei is if you tell, then Wu Lei, we do have a precedent in modern Chinese uh, syntax. <coughs> Does this make sense to people? And this would seem to be the version that is closer to the time of Confucius, which is very different from uh, the two versions of the text. OK, um, I'll return to this later. But a quick recap. So we have at least three different types of interpretations of Yu Jiao Wu Lei. One is an exhortation. When you teach, you should not treat students of different social economic backgrounds differently. This is about how you should treat your students. The second is a narrative or description uh, describing how Confucius is teaching. So it basically says, I teach all students regardless of their social economic background. And then you have a conditional interpretation which basically says, if you educate people, the differences between social and ethnic groups will be obliterated. Okay. Question? Yeah. Uh, on the narrative, you say uh, modern commentaries and then pro-drop problem. Yes. What does that mean? Uh, pro-drop is dropping the pronoun, dropping the I. We run into the problem of the fact that the I is dropped okay. in this interpretation. Yeah. And later, um, or you know what, let's not wait until later. Uh, I'll talk really briefly about the problem that we have here. Um, it would seem that the interpretation that is closest to the time of Confucius and the one uh, that is more, most consistent with classical Chinese grammar is this conditional one. If they receive education, then differences will be unrelated. But ever since the 5th century, the Chinese population <laughs> has been exposed to these two versions, the narrative and the Exhortations. Now, the 5th century to the 21st century, that's like 1,500 years, right? That's not a short time either. So you can't really ignore this period of history because um, generations of Chinese have been brought up on this. So when you're translating, you're basically given different versions, both of which, or maybe all three of which, are important, and you will probably have to choose one. Okay, um, so basically, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that you're going to run into different types of interpretation, and you can't really say the one is wrong and the other is right because of the issue that we just um, talked about. 
I'm going to give you another example that's kind of like this. This also comes from the analytes. Um, a lot of you are familiar with the expression Zhongyong, right? What does it mean? Anybody? Zhongyong. Zhongyong zhi wei de ye, qi zhi yi gu, ming xian zi li. What is Zhongyong? Now, your first instinct might be to fall back on your modern Chinese. You all know what Zhong means, right? Zhong means middle, right? Yong, you might know from the expression Yong Su, which is ordinary or common. So Zhong Yong is probably uh, not too high, not too low, somewhere in the middle. Uh, ordinary. Does that make sense? OK. And is it correct? Let's look for commentaries. Uh, the interpretation that I just described basically sits well with the commentary by Zhu Xi of the 12th century. He says, Zhong Zhe, Hu Pian Bu Yi. Okay, so Zhong is avoiding the two extremes, being somewhere in the middle. What is Yong? Yong is Ping Chang. Okay, that is in line with what we have in modern Chinese. But again, okay, Zhu Xi lived in the 12th century. Confucius lived around 500 BC, so that's like 1600 years apart. We want to try and find something that's closer to the time of Confucius, and that's not too hard to do because around the time of Confucius, there was a book called Zhong Yong. So let's look at what the book Zhong Yong says about Zhong Yong. Um, er, I forgot to talk about this, but never mind, we'll do that right here. In the Zhong Yong, it says, Xi nu ai le zhi wei fa, wei zhi zhong, fa er jie zhong jie, wei zhi he. Forget the he for now, just look at the Zhong. Xi nu ai le zhi wei fa, uh, wei zhi zhong. Does it mean the same thing as what we saw before? Zhu xi wu pian bu yi, wei zhi zhong. No. The zhong here talks about your emotions, xi wu ai, xi nu ai le. And it's saying that when it's inside of you, when it hasn't been expressed, that's what we're calling the zhong. So zhong here is talking about something that is inside of you. It's basically talking about um, an uncorrupted, pristine state. Okay, and you'll see that some translations um, use this interpretation. I'm going to skip this for now and see where the problem lies. The difference between Zhu Xi's interpretation and what we saw from the uh, Zhong Yong is that we're talking about two different kinds of middle. Okay, when you talk about something being in the middle, um, you can look at it from different dimensions. There's a one dimensional middle, there's a two dimensional middle, there's a three dimensional middle. When you're looking at only one dimension, a line, then the joke is the midpoint between two extremes, right? When you're looking at three dimensions, then the joke is the core, the inside of a three-dimensional body. It would appear that uh, the joke in the book is talking about this kind of middle, whereas Zhu Xi is talking about this kind of one-dimensional middle. Zhu Xi was probably wrong, but then, Zhu uh, Xi influenced a lot of later thinkers for about 800 years. So even if he was wrong, it is hard to dismiss um, his interpretation. And that is part of the problem um, that we run into when we're interpreting classical Chinese. OK, I think that is all I have for the interpretation part. Um, any questions up to this point? OK, we don't have a lot of time now. When do we finish? Is it nine or three on the The schedule says nine, but nine. I'm sure people will love it if you go even 9.30. Oh, because <laughs> I still have about uh, half the speech to cover. I'll try to <laughs> Okay, up to this point, we've been talking about tools. We've been talking about dictionaries, we've been talking about commentaries, and then performing scholarly analyses based on these commentaries. This is to get at the meaning of a digital text. Now, what I'm going to talk about next is once you have a few candidates, once you have some different interpretations of the text, who gets to decide? Or when you look at it another way, if there are conflicting interpretations of a text, who has the right to decide? Um, what would you say is the answer? Who ultimately gets to decide what this text means? Do you get to decide? Do you, the translator, get to decide? <laughs> the translator or the editor? Yeah? <laughs> well, the fact that you're asking us yeah. kind of answers the question. We get to decide. <laughs> we get to decide. The translator decides. 
Uh, you can decide that someone else decides. Okay, that is actually a good answer. In fact, you do get to decide. But there are also people that would argue perhaps the author gets to decide. Or perhaps the readers get to decide. Or perhaps you should look for answers in the text itself. So that's kind of where I'm going with this. Um, when do you rely on the author? When do you rely on the reader? When do you rely on the text itself? Now what does literary theory tell us about this? Now the Chinese tradition of interpreting is one that uh, basically goes with the author. Okay, and in literary critical terms, this is sometimes referred to as author-based criticism, or biographical criticism, or social historical criticism. When you perform this sort of interpreting, basically what we're doing is we're seeing the text as the reflection of an author's life and times. You have to understand as much as you can about the life of the author and use these clues from the author's life to fill in the gaps in the text itself. Um, so we're basically seeing the text as a sort of biography. Okay, and this seems to make sense if you look at translation uh, the way an interpreter looks at interpreting. If you're interpreting, interpreting for a speaker, the speaker basically has the right to decide what he wants to mean. If you're not there, you can to the speaker to try to convey uh, the meaning that he wants to get across. And if you use that same approach, then you're basically using an author-based approach, approach to criticism. Okay, this would seem legitimate um, until the 20th century when people started to rebel against this. Well, actually, before talking about rebellion, uh, let me tell you how this might be useful in some places. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this verse from the Sun Guo Yi. Okay, it's Dou Ren Dou Ji, Dou Zai Fu Zhong Qi, Ben Shi Tong Den Sheng, Xiang Jian He Tai Ji. On the surface, this looks like a poem about frying beans or uh, beans, <laughs> right? Okay, and if you don't look to the social historical background, if you don't look at the author, then this seems to be exactly what it's about. But if you have some information about the author, if you understand the situation between the two brothers, uh, Cao Pi and Cao Qi, and how Cao Pi wanted to kill Cao Qi and forced him to write a poem, within taking seven steps and came up with this, then um, it gives this poem a lot of additional meaning. On the one hand, it's about the beans and the roots uh, being fried, but on the other hand, it's about two brothers, one wanting to kill the other, and the bean and the, the bean roots are a metaphor for the two brothers because they come from the same uh, root. They were born from the same womb, so to speak. Okay, so this is how um, information about the background of the author can enrich a text um, in some instances. And when you translate something like this, then you want to not just translate the process with the finding of the beans, but make that human dimension come out. Okay, here's one translation. Beans of simmer on a beanstalk flame. From inside the pot, express their ire. And then, quote, alive we sprouted on a single root. What's your rush to cook us on fire? Okay, so one part of the bean speaking to another, which makes it more human, and this can be applied to two brothers. Okay, so this is one way to interpret a text, to go with what the author intended. Um, but there are people that are against this. Okay, um, this basically came up at the beginning of the 20th century. People who are against this kind of author-based criticism calls the, call this the intentional fallacy, or the genetic fallacy. And their argument was this, basically, the design or intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging the success of a work of literary life. What that is saying is, number one, you have no way of knowing what the author means. You cannot get into the mind of the author you are not in. Number two, if it's literature we're talking about, literature is something that has aesthetic appeal. And that aesthetic appeal would not come from the life of the author. Because if so, then literature is basically biography. And I think most people agree that literature is not biography. One is artistic, and the other is not. OK, so they make the argument that uh, you should not base your interpretation on the intention of the author. And there are a lot of authors that go with this. 
Okay, uh, playwrights such as Harold Pinter, Samuel Beckett, refuse to tell people what their real intentions are because they want the text to speak for itself. All right then, if not the author, then who do we go with? And the natural uh, place to go would be the reader. And there are a lot of people who argue that um, the interpretation of the text should come from the reader. Okay, and that brings us into the realm of reception theories or reader response theories. In this theoretical framework, we're basically looking at the relationship between the author and the reader um, as analogous to the relationship between a manufacturer and a consumer. Okay, so the person who manufactures this marker is not as important as me, who is actually using the marker. Since this is my marker, I bought it, I can do whatever I want with it, right? I am not limited to what the uh, manufacturer wants me to do with it. Does this make sense to people? Okay, so if we use this metaphor on texts, then it basically says it's the readers that give a text its meaning. Okay, to look at it another way, um, what they're really saying is that the text is useless without combining with your own experiences. The way a text becomes useful is you take the text and you apply your own experiences to it, and it's you, the reader's experiences, that give the text its meaning. Okay, so then the onus falls on the reader. If we want to know what a text means, we have to look at how a reader interprets it. And the problem here is that there are all sorts of different readers, so there are all sorts of different interpretations. Okay, um, so quotes. So Roland Barthes says, the birth of the reader must be at the cost of the death of the author. What he is basically saying is ignore the author, he's not important, we don't care what he thinks, what is important is what you, the reader, thinks. So the birth of the reader. Okay, Wolfgang Geiser says, literature or text is kind of like a user's manual. The manual is not important. When I buy stuff, uh, the other day I was buying this toy for my little kid. It was a slide. So I looked at the manual, uh, put the slide together, and then I threw the manual away. So the important thing is, the manual teaches me how to put the slide together. I'm not going to teach the manual together and read it like the Bible or something, read it over and over again. If you apply that metaphor to what they're trying to say here is, when you have a work of literature, a text, what it's trying to do is to help you achieve an experience. It's that experience that is important. The text itself uh, is not. Okay, so um, a quick application. You'll yeah, well, like, if we were to ask what the author meant, uh, most likely, although we have no way of getting into Confucius's head, but um, if we look at the interpretations that are closer to Confucius's time and the grammar of the sentence, then what's closest to the author's intention is probably a conditional reading. If you give them education, then there will be no differences between different classes. However, we have another reader interpretation that of Wonka, basically telling you how you should teach your students, or um, a later interpretation telling you how Confucius teaches his students. So we basically have some kind of tension between an author meaning and a reader meaning. Uh, if we apply it to the Zhong Yong, then again, the author meaning is the Zhong as a three-dimensional middle, which is the core of a three-dimensional entity. First is a 12th century reader interpretation, which is the drone as a one-dimensional midpoint of a line. And again, we have the tension between the two. I'm sorry, did you say Jung was a uh, different meaning for Jung as well? I oh, actually, uh, yeah, I did talk about Jung. Uh, what we're talking about here is just the drone. According to the earlier meaning, uh, Jung means Jung, which is to use or apply. Ah. Okay, and uh, when you come to think about it, even when you have a single reader, when you read a text the first time and then read it again the second time, the second experience is probably going to be different from the first experience. Right? Mm -hmm. So again, you have two different types of meanings. And then if you divide your readers into different groups, 
men versus women readers, uh, the women readers will have a different type of meaning, giving rise to things like feminist criticism. If you look at colonized people versus colonizers, then you have post-colonial criticism, which uh, tries to manifest these different types of meanings. When you look at uh, Marxism, you have Marxist criticism, which will give a very different interpretation from people who are not living under a Marxist culture. Again, using Yotel Wule as an example. Uh, this interpretation of Yotel Wule comes from a book published in China in the 1970s during the height of the Cultural Revolution. Okay, so basically, it takes a totally negative view of uh, what Confucius treats as Yu Jiao Wu Lei. What's interesting here is number one, uh, they are still interpreting Yu Jiao Wu Lei as what Confucius does. So it's our uh, narrative interpretation. But number two, they're saying that what he's doing here is limited to the higher social classes only. And because it applies only to the higher social classes, that is anti-communism, basically. Okay, um, it looks like I'm not going to finish, but uh, I'll do a few more slides, and I'm going to be back again on Friday. Maybe we can finish the rest on Friday. Um, Orientalism and Occidentalism. This is about looking at issues from an Eastern perspective versus a Western perspective. Edward Said would argue that uh, Orientalism gives you a different, no, that's not the way to put it. Uh, what he is saying is that there is this view of the Orient that is based on bias, uh, a bias that is how a Western person views the Orient. And you get that same kind of bias when certain people in the East view the West as the Moonlight describes the West as urban, modern, and glamorous, or conversely as soulless and materialistic, or the West as a giving a dehumanizing picture of the West painted by its enemies. Okay, um, anyway, because of time, let me first go to my conclusion and I'll finish the rest of writing. Okay, so up to this point, what can we expect to take away? Uh, two things. One regarding understanding the source text, the other uh, regarding choosing a translation perspective. When it comes to understanding the source text, it's probably the easiest to use commentaries and perform scholarly analysis. And when you do the latter, you do want to apply things like logic, syntax, stylistics, structure, and do a corpus search. When you're choosing a translation perspective, ask yourself, um, do you want to use an author-based perspective, a certain type of reader-based perspective, or are you going to rely on just the text? And what is the audience and the purpose of your translation? What sort of experience are you hoping to create? And when you take all of this into consideration, you will realize that there is no such thing as a standard or perfect translation because you have so many options that are out there and all of these options are legitimate. Okay, I'll stop here and see if people have any questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> it seems also there is uh, a difference in the time of translation. Yes. Uh, so the, in other words, the Iliad and the Odyssey mm -hmm. can be and should be probably retranslated every couple decades or something exactly. like that. So that would be um, uh, the readership uh, issue. Yes. Um, so you don't be, in other words, all of our work is going to be supplanted uh, in a couple of decades anyway. Or to look at it another way, there is always the need for new translations. It's not the case that once you have this really good translation, you don't need a new translation. Uh, the fact that time is progressing, you get new readers using new types of language, necessitates the need uh, for new translations. So what you're doing is really useful. Any other questions? Well, I remember when you translate um, the search 
ultra uh, twenty to twenty set two exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, there there is a term you translate it as engine instead oh, of the original term. Uh -huh. Would you please tell us about this translation? How did you make the decision to translate it as engine instead of Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, I am no expert in Buddhist methods, so uh, there are areas where I stand to be corrected, and please correct me if I have any misunderstandings. The passage that Kim was referring to is this passage in the Sutra 22 sections where uh, I'm going to have to use somewhat sexual language. Is that okay for people here? Are there underage people? Uh, it refers to something sexual. Is that okay? No. It's not okay. Okay. Um, how should I do this? Okay. Let me describe this in a roundabout way. Um, the passage basically says something like, a man, there's this man who cannot control his sexual desires, so he wants to do something physically, and the Buddha says, don't do that, because it's not the physical organ that's important. It's the mind that is important. And then he goes on to give a metaphor. The metaphor has to do with different Chinese official titles. Um, in a Chinese government, you have people that are higher up the leaders, and you have the people that are the subordinates, right? So the metaphor is that uh, this person that is higher up the leader is kind of like the mind, and the sexual organ you're, kind of, you're talking about is somebody at the lower level. So if you want to shut off these desires, then you should go for the person the higher up level, rather than somewhere the lower level. Now, um, these official titles are titles that would not be familiar to modern readers, even Chinese readers. So I replaced that metaphor altogether, and I used uh, the metaphor of the engine versus uh, the things, the dirty things that the engine spews out. So I basically said, once you turn off the engine, then these dirty thoughts will come out and spew out, something like that. Um, so, did I answer your question? I, I, your question was? Uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, well, you, okay. you try to get the idea across. I try to get the idea across, yes. What this, uh, this text is about. Yes. But then, you lost the original word. Exactly. So, if the reader wants to know to know about the Chinese text, yes. then they will not be able to know the original term from your translation. Yes, and I would argue that you have different types of readerships. Uh, you would have to decide at the outset, are you translating for somebody that ultimately wants to learn about ancient Chinese culture and is willing to look at the references, or are you aiming at somebody who wants to get it in the right way and not have to rely on that? Are you going for immediate effect, or do you have a sitting audience, kind of like a college classroom, or graduate class where the students are expected to learn culture and history in addition to understanding the text. I went for the first type of audience rather than the second type. But it would be equally legitimate to go for the second type of audience. OK, so um, I guess we have another question. Sure. When uh, you were talking about Jiji Fu Jiji, you were talking about uh, you found a historical of how that how that word was pronounced like way a long time ago. Yes. How did you do that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, this is a bit of historical linguistics. Mm -hmm. The first thing you could do is you can look at rhyme books such as the Guangyun or Qiyun. Uh, the Guangyun dates from the Song Dynasty, and the Qiyun is a little bit earlier, but it's not complete. There are people that have reconstructed it and uh, given the reconstructions of every character in there in the IPA. So it's possible to take the character and look it up and see how it was pronounced about a thousand years ago. Uh, if you want to go earlier, then there's more guesswork involved, but that is sometimes possible too. What, what, which Guangyun? What is? What's the two words? Guangyun. Uh, Guangdao. Guangdao. Oh, Yayun. Yayun. It's a rhyme dictionary. Ah. And Qiyun. Uh, oh, Qiyun. Okay. Qiyun. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, on Friday, I guess for those of you that are going to be here on Friday, 
But rather what I'm hoping to do is, I'm hoping to give you a few texts and have you guys translate. I'll probably get a few people to come up here and do the translation on the blackboard and to talk as you translate to tell us what's going through your head. And um, one thing to keep in mind is when you translate on Friday, I want people to produce at least two different versions. That is to say, take at least two different approaches and then see what you come up with. All right, thank you.